Greetings. My name is Kathy Overton, and I'm with the Friends of Arlington's David M. Brown Planetarium. Uh, we are a nonprofit group that helps support the Arlington Planetarium and uh, endeavors to uh, have public education for science uh, in the Arlington area. Uh, the planetarium right now is closed. This is late spring of 2022, but things are looking up and we think that we now have the school board and the Arlington Public Schools ready to reopen the planetarium at some point this fall. So we're looking forward to having live events again in the planetarium, both for the public and of course for Arlington County School students. Uh, but in the meantime, until the planetarium reopens this fall, we are still bringing you various events and informational uh, activities. Uh, there will be some more events happening this summer, but tonight we are going to hear from Dr. Seth Ann Howard, who is going to tell us about spiral galaxies. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Howard right now, and uh, you can ask questions in the chat, and I will relay them to Dr. Howard. So with that, uh, Dr. Howard, go ahead and start. Thank you, Kathy. And the, here's the title slide, and the missing from the word is the word galaxies. <laughs> Why do spiral galaxies spiral? So the first question you'd want to ask yourself is, what is a galaxy? And it's a large system of stars, gas, dust, planets, and they're all held together, a large system being a, a billion, more than a billion stars held together by mutual gravitation, isolated from similar systems by vast regions of space. I took this from Wikipedia and it's got an error because it's not vast. Galaxies are closer together with respect to each other than stars are as close together with respect to each other. Stars are further apart uh, with respect to their size. So it isn't really vast regions of space. It is large though. So what is a galaxy and what's a spiral galaxy? Well, galaxies come in two general types. They come as fried eggs. These are spirals, flat, fried egg is flat with a yolk in the middle. And that's what, and, and then however you fry it, it gets messy. And that's what spirals look like. It has 10 to the 11th stars in it at, on, as av on average. Hard boiled eggs are ellipticals, the other type. There are dwarf ellipticals, 10 to the 10th stars and regular ellipticals 10 to the 12th stars they look like hard-boiled eggs there are a few left over that don't quite fit and we very cleverly call them irregulars spirals are common quite common in space and dwarf dwarf ellipticals are also quite common the big ellipticals are less common so let's look at, there's an elliptical galaxy and you see it looks kind of like a hard boiled egg. No matter which way you look at it, it's gonna look just like that. But let's look at an assortment of spirals. See how that depends on which way you look at it, how many spiral arms it has, how the spiral arms are messy or clean, uh, whether they are tightly wrapped or loosely wrapped and lots of different things. So here's a, here's a spiral galaxy from the side and you see it's very thin. In fact, it's, they're very thin with respect to their size and they come in all kinds of spiral, spiral shapes. We've got two armed grand design spirals. That's the, the, the general basic spiral galaxy. It's called a grand design. Two, two main spiral arms. Then there are multi-armed spirals. I got a picture up there on the upper right. Then there are bars. We like bars. There's a bar across the middle and the bar carries the arms along with it. So the bar is a good thing to have. The problem is not all, gal not all spiral galaxies have bars, maybe half of them. 
There's a flocculent spiral, just kind of messy. The fried egg didn't quite make it. And their rings, you see there's a faint ring sideways. And then in the center, there's a brighter ring. And in the center of that are some spiral arms. That's a ring galaxy. Now, we live in the Milky Way. That's our home galaxy. Here's a picture of a Milky Way seen on edge. Now, as I go through the talk, I want you to think about how this picture could have been taken. We obviously can't get outside the Milky Way because we're in the middle of it and we can't take a picture of it. So how, how what, this is a real photograph. How was it, how was it con constructed? Think about it. I'll, I'll let you know if you got, if you can't figure it out. Um, here's, here's it, where we are. We are 20,000 light years from the middle where the bulge or yolk of the egg is. The thickness of the spiral galaxy is 1,000 light years, the Milky Way, and it's 100,000 light years in diameter or greater. So it's a factor of 10 longer than it is thick. And the bulge, is, bulge or yolk is in the middle. The halo is, is just loosely gathered stars circling the, the uh, uh, main spiral galaxy. There are not as many stars in the halo as there are in the, in the disk. But we are quite a ways out from the center. Now, if, if we have an artist draw what this would look like if we were on the top of it, we see that they think that the Milky Way is a bar galaxy. You see the bar in the middle? And the sun is right there. We're on the Orion Spur. That's the, I had, I had my pointer there, right there. And we measure everything as if the sun were the center and aimed at the center of the galaxy. So zero degrees galactic longitude is this line here. So that's what it looks like an artist thinks it looks like from the top. So what causes those arms? There are actually several ideas that came and went. First of all, Jan Oort and Van de Hulst were Dutch astronomers in the first half of the 20th century. And they basically said what you think is obvious, everything is moving or else it would all fall together. Everything has to move. But they showed that the disk is actually, this stars in the disk are actually doing what is called circular orbits around the center and differential rotation. Now, what is differential rotation? We gotta find out what the stars are doing before we can talk about their arms. Differential rotation, close to the middle, the material moves the fastest. At the outer edge, it moves the slowest. So it goes from fast on the inside to slow on the outside. The sun has an orbital speed about 200 kilometers per second. You are moving around the galaxy at 200 kilometers per second. You, the sun, the solar system, and the earth, you may not realize you're moving that fast, but you are. And you ought to be able to ask yourself, why don't we feel it? And answer that question. That's 448,000 miles per hour. Most objects have the same orbital speed, 200 kilometers per second, but they have different rotation rates. They, they rotate fast in the middle and slow on the outside. Now, that's going to give us a particular kind of structure. Here's other types of rotation. Suppose on the top left picture, you're a wheel. And point A goes slower than point D goes. D goes faster. 
So it's slow on the inside and fast on the outside. This is like the old fashioned uh, line of ice skaters where there's an ice skater in the middle and the ice skater on the outside skates very, very fast to keep up with the rest. That's a wheel-like rotation. And you can make a rotation curve for that. You plot the orbital speed, how fast it's going, versus the distance from the center. And here's where A is, B, C, D, and it, it's a straight line going up at 45 degrees. That's a wheel. Then the, then the solar system. If you're a solar system, you have the sun in the middle, and A goes the fastest, Mercury. B goes a little bit slower. C goes slower yet, and D goes slower yet. And you, you plot that up, and you get a graph with orbital speed going up and distance from the center this way. You get a line like this. And until the 20th century, people thought that that is what galaxies must be doing. But along came some intrepid astronomers who actually measured the, the rotation curve of the Milky Way. And look, it's almost flat. It rises sharply at the center. That's okay. And then it wiggles a little bit as it goes through spiral, spiral arms. And then it's sort of gently rising, but mainly flat. And those are flat rotation curves. If you've heard of the name Vera Rubin, she did most of the work showing that spiral galaxies have flat rotation curves. And that was unexpected. They, they thought they would look like a solar system, but they don't. And this has the orbital speed plotted up the y-axis and distance from the center of the Milky Way in light years along the x-axis. So we've got moving stars in a differentially rotating disk. How do we get arms? Well, here's what we have to do if we were doing truth and justice. They require that we use the full Boltzmann equation. Don't worry about that. It's just a fancy equation. With Maxwell's equations, 10 to the 11th stars with stellar birth and death, gas dynamics. That's what truth and justice require we use. I'm going to show you what those equations look like. And don't worry about them because they're going to disappear very quickly. Boltzmann's on the top. Maxwell comes down the rest of the screen. And now they disappear so much for truth and justice. We cannot do that. We don't have the capability right now of using the whole scheme to build a galaxy and follow the spiral structure. We don't have enough computer power to do that. So what explanations have we come up with? Well, in the first half of the 20th century, Bertel Lindblad essentially derived the whole theory of gravitational rotation. And it's mathematically difficult to follow, but it forms the basis for all the rest that follows. Bars, we like bars. The problem is not every spiral has a bar because the bar will drive the arms along as it rotates. It will drive the arms with it. If, if every spiral had a bar, we wouldn't have a problem, but that's not the case. Uh, a lot of spirals don't have bars. Stochastic star formation was an idea that kind of came and went. Uh, it means stochastic star formation explodes in different parts of the galaxy at any given time, but you can form a, a bunch of stars in one area and the next one might be across the galaxy. So you have a lot of trouble with stochastic star formation forming a uniform line. Remember the grand design spiral I showed you? That's a, that had a uniform a line, a, arm that came down and didn't wiggle around. Stochastic star formation can't do that. So that's probably not what happens. Then in the 1960s, Lin and Shu came up with density wave theory. 
this is what's in the textbooks today. They say that density waves are what causes spiral arms. I'll talk about that in a second. There's another explanation, and that is tidal interactions. Tides with another passing galaxy, they, in, they induce global structure. Maybe that'll work too, we'll see. Density waves or tides or both. Well, Bertha Lindblad developed the basis. What he did was start with that Boltzmann, nasty Boltzmann equation. And his result was that stars move in epicycles. If you remember your ancient astronomy, Ptolemy and the ancient Greeks all believed that everything moved in circles, perfect circles. Circles were perfect. Not ellipses, but circles. Stars move in epicycles. This is a, a slide that shows you different kinds of epicycles. Down on the bottom is one with the Earth in the center, as would be used by Ptolemy, and shows Mars with its little epicycles as it goes around the Earth. And on the right side of the bottom is showing you how retrograde motion happens with epicycles. Epicycles is a little circle rolling around a bigger circle. And galaxies up here, this is what happens. The star is that little tiny circle, and you see it, for, it forms an ellipse as it goes around the galaxy. That's an, that's an epicycle. And epicycles came up, Lindblad came up with epicycles when he fixed the Boltzmann equation to be mathematically feasible. And Ptolemy used perfect circles. So perfect circles don't work because we know planets move in ellipses, not circles. Epicycles in a galaxy, this is how the galaxy is down there near the bottom lower right. And then ep, uh, as you move out from the center at 10 kiloparsecs from the center, this is to, to scale. One centimeter equals one kiloparsec on this graph. And you get little tiny epicycles here and bigger ones further out. But a companion's going to go by and it's going to gravitationally tug the stars. It won't take them out of their epicycles, but it'll tug them a little bit. So they tend to cluster. And when they cluster, they form an arm. So that tides can form an arm. Epicycles, because of epicycles, you can do this. Density waves, however, Lin and Chu in 1964, they didn't start with Boltzmann. They started with quantum mechanics. And they postulated that on the disk was a rigidly, rigidly rotating wave. They postulated it. They just said it's there. It's quasi-stationary. You get epicycles. That's good but the wave, wave must be tightly round, wound. In other words, the pitch angle of the wave has to be 13 to 14 degrees. That's I equals pitch angle. That's pitch angle is, is how far from the, the straight, uh, straight line it is, how far it turns with respect to the straight line. You can measure it with a compass and a ruler. And there's no explanation in their theory of how the wave got there. This is, you're, you are all familiar with density waves because when you travel the beltway and you come upon a slowdown of traffic and you enter the, the slowdown, you slowly, painfully move through it and then you come out the other side and it's usually nothing but a bunch of cars close together and there's nothing causing it. It just is sitting there. 
and it slowly moves around and you move through it. So this is what a density wave would look like as it turns around. It stays in the same position, but the stars move through it. The star doesn't stop in the middle. Well, normally on the beltway, you might stop, but normal stars don't stop in the middle. That's a density wave. And all of you have experienced a density wave. I'm sure you've been caught in a traffic snarl. Here is a, uh, an arm that is not a spiral uh, density wave. And this is going to wind itself up. This is what an uh, arm would do if you just let it turn. It would wind up. This is actually a mistake because they started the computer program with the arm already there. You've got to get the arm there in the first place to make it honest. Whoops. It's going to wind up, but all arms wind up no matter how they get started, they all wind up and, and disappear. Now, M51 on the left is an open armed galaxy. It's not appropriate for density waves. A tightly wound galaxy is like NGC 4622 on the right. You see the arms are very tightly wound around the, the oak in the center. Uh, that's where you would apply a density wave in the middle. But the first guess, M51 at the tip of its arm has a companion, a little, little tiny galaxy going around it. And that's a companion galaxy. And in 1941, Bertolt Lindblad said he didn't know it was a separate galaxy. He just said the tides of the well-known companion at the end of one of the arms in M51 is responsible for the spiral structure. So that's the earliest guess, and it probably is still the best, but we'll see. I'm going to use M51, therefore, because Bertolt Lindblad did to study spiral structure. It's a grand design galaxy. It has two main spiral arms. It's got a little companion at the end of one of the spiral arms that causes tides. Tidal tides, just like they do on Earth. I'll show you that in a minute. Distance is it's three, about three million light years away. And its mass is 100 billion solar masses. If you had a 10 inch telescope and looked for M51 in the sky, this is what it would look like. It, I pointed it out with an arrow and it, you, it wouldn't look like much, <laughs> but that's M51 in a small telescope, which is all they had in the 1800s and the 1700s. So, so we'll go back to tides now, notice that the Earth and the Moon, tides on the Earth-Moon system, and galaxy tidal arms are very similar to this, where the companion is, is like the Moon, and the main spiral galaxy is like the Earth. So high tide is on the Moon side and the opposite side of the Earth. Do you, know, you guys know that, of course. High tide occurs on both, on both opposing sides. This side right here and this side right here. And you notice these little tiny red arrows show you where it's pulling on the epicycles to cluster them together. But low tide occurs 90 degrees away and you notice it's pulling them apart. That's low tide, rarefication, clustering and rarefication. And rarefication happens on both sides of the earth as well. So high tide on both sides, verification on both sides, and galaxy companion, it's exactly the same. Works exactly the same. 
So let's see what the arms of, of M51 tell us. If you mark out the arm with a bunch of little squares, you mark out the left arm, you mark out the left arm with squares and the right arm with circles. It's hard to see, but they are circles on this side and squares on this side. And you unwind it. You want to find out where how it got started. So the time it takes to get to where it is, is the cotangent of the pitch, the pitch of the angle of the arm, which is almost the same as the radius, dis the distance from the center, divided by the speed. So the time it takes to get where it is, is the cotangent of the pitch. So you measure the pitches of all those little squares and circles. You measure the cotangent of the pitches. And you can do this with a computer, or you can do this with a, if you have a big enough picture, you can do it with a protractor and a, and a, a ruler. So I did them both ways, and they came out with the same answer. And if you back up the squares, these squares back up to these squares, these circles, these circles here back up to these circles here. So if you time reverse that arm, it actually forms a structure. This is like an arm. And this is tides. This is when the companion galaxy probably went closest to M51. And it pulled on those little epicycles until it made the arm come together and cluster and formed an arm. And the arm moved itself around until it got to here. 70 million light years later. So you uh, unwind the arm. Now I'm going to show you a complicated graph because, and don't worry about it if it doesn't make sense to you, because this is if you, I went down to here, if you measure this all the way around as far as you can go, what, what else is going to happen? Well, this arm here goes through dispersion orbits until it comes 90 degrees away. And this is the rarefication side. So you have rarefication. Uh, where'd my pointer go? Rarefications. And this is condensation, compression. You form the arm here. It's rarefied on this side, pulling apart. And the arm tells us this. It says, this is what I did. So spiral arm, it's like a closing fan. As, as it turns around, as the galaxy rotates differentially, it, clust it closes a fan. It closes the fan here. They get closer and closer together to form a, 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 an arm. And then later, the arm resonates with the center and forms, tickles the inner structure into being. And those are where density waves come from. That's how come if they get density waves. They left that part out of the theory. So spiral so Yes. So, so Dr. Howard, um, you do have a question about how galaxies form in the first place. Do some initial conditions always lead to arms? Uh, no. You get ellipticals, which are hard-boiled eggs, have no structure whatsoever, in, in the, no spiral structure. And some of the spirals are very messy and they're irregulars. Uh, dwarf spirals have little tiny spiral arms, maybe, but they're mainly irregular. So it doesn't always lead to spiral structure when you form a galaxy. I mean, it, you, you get ellipticals, 
which are the ones without structure, and you get spirals, the ones with structure. And there are as many spirals as there are dwarf ellipticals. And do we have any idea how they are formed in the first place, either of these types? Well, yes. People think they form out of a, a giant molecular cloud that slowly spins in space. And as it spins, it flattens. That's what spinning things do. They flatten. And eventually, it, it comes down to form a galaxy at the end. It, 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 it either will come together as a cir circular fried egg or a flat fried egg, a circular hard-boiled egg, or a flat fried egg as it circles around as the gas and dust form stars. And we don't know when these started in the beginning. We don't know if they were beginning at the very first instant of time. We don't think so. We think they started later, but we don't know. Does that help? I hope so. Um, and uh, you can go ahead and continue with your presentation. Okay. Tidal impulse by the companion starts the spiral arm to develop. The closing fan forms a material arm. That's the where the the when I time reversed the arm, it formed a straight line. That's the material arm star formation. And the inner structure is later tickled into existence. It's, it's density waves, dispersion orbits, and the, the density wave moves outward as time passes. So the density wave is there. There's nothing wrong with it. It just it doesn't explain how it got there. And tides explain how it got there. But regardless of how you start, all arms wind up. After three or so, three or four galactic rotations, uh, they wrote all the way, something goes all the way around once, three or four of them, it's going to wind up, all arms, whether they're density waves, uh, tides, whatever, they're going to wind up. So you've got to do something. So what you do is do it all over again. You let the companion come by again and start the whole procedure over. You just keep repeating it as the orb as the companion orbits the main galaxy. And the companion for M51 is orbiting it. It's bound. It's gravitationally bound to the M51 and it's orbiting. It, right now it's beneath the, the plane of the sky. It's behind M51. But 70 million years ago, it was in the plane of M51. So saying the same thing again, in a different way, tidal perturbations, like tides on Earth, can produce most observed spiral structure. Arm development is cascaded. Initially, it's tidal material arms. They're sensitive to the details of the triggering gravitational interaction. Those are sensitive to how you triggered it, how that companion went by, how heavy it was, how close it was. Then, subsequently, you resonate and tickle the inside detailed structure, and that's the density wave. It develops, but the density waves are insensitive to how it got started. So you can have a density wave, but it comes later in the sequence. So which version do you like? It depends on your point of view. I like tides. Most textbooks today say density waves. I think they're wrong, but it all depends on your point of view. So we can't visit it. So what do we do? We simulate one. And I have to mention that in 1941, 
Eric Holberg, Holmberg actually did the first computer simu uh, not computer, but first simulation. He used light bulbs and he placed about 40 odd light bulbs around forming a galaxy and he had light sensitive devices measuring the light and he would move a, a light bulb and measure how the light changed as he moved the light bulb and he would move all 40 all at once or uh, all at once to let the galaxy evolve with time to see if spiral structure would develop he did get some structure but with 40 odd light bulbs you can't do much but he was the first one who did it and after that everybody else started running computers after Holmberg. Here is a uh, uh, arms that wind up. The tidal trigger occurred here. There's the companion galaxy and it crashed through the edge of the galaxy here and you see it start to wind up here. That's how arms wind up after a tidal trigger. So we've simulated M51. It has a small companion. The two-dimensional simulations show that the outer arms are material. That's the initial stage of development. The impulse was 70 to 80 million years ago to form that arm. And three-dimensional simulations show that the velocity field of M51 is also matched. So the simulations show us that agree with the fact that tidal structure formed the outer material arms first. Here's M51. Here's a simulation on the right of M51 with uh, 100,000 stars, which isn't very many. As I said, you have to use 10 to the 11th, to be honest. But this is, this is the tidal companion behind the galaxy now, and here is where the impulse occurred, but it does form a structure just like M51 over here on the left, forms a, a structure like this. Those are the same squares and circles that I drew before. Now, galaxies are closer together than stars are with respect to their size. Galaxies cluster they interact with each other and that improves the chance of tides. Here's a picture of a galaxy cluster. Galaxy clusters, here's some more pictures of galaxies interacting. Low velocity tidal interactions were very clever. We say about one companion galaxy per giga year is cannibalized by the main spiral. It eats it it absorbs it. A galaxy can merge with another galaxy. You can that the, it's not a low velocity. These could be equally sized galaxies merging with each other. You could have a high velocity tidal interaction. That's a very speedy companion going by the main spiral very fast. So it doesn't stay around to come back and do it again. It could collide. You could have galaxies collide. That's kind of rare. Uh, in, intracluster medium and interstellar medium. That's what the initials stand for. Intracluster medium and interstellar medium stripping, which means the medium in between the galaxies is harassing it, bothering it. It's called galaxy harassment. So you have a question in the chat, which I believe you've made just have answered, which was, must the perturbing body be near the plane of the galaxy? And it sounds like it does not need to be near the plane of the galaxy. No, it usually is. But that's its closest approach, usually, but it doesn't have to be. It could, it if, if you're... Uh, you, you start tidally interacting when you're quite a distance away. 
so no, it doesn't have to be uh, uh, in the plane of the galaxy when you have your interaction. So here's the Milky Way. Here's the Milky Way over here. And here are the Magellanic Clouds. And there's a tidal stream of debris from their last passage around the Milky Way. It pulled out all this debris to get to the Magellanic Clouds. And there's a dwarf, ellip, dwarf uh, spiral or elliptical, I don't know which, Sagittarius is being assimilated right now. And uh, so the Mil Milky Way actually is in a group of galaxies and there are 50 to 60 galaxies in this member, members of this group. So the Milky Way is not isolated in space. Uh, our nearest big companion is Andromeda, the galaxy Andromeda M31. But there are about 50 to 60 member galaxies in the local group, that's what we call it, the local group, the group around the Milky Way. So there are lots of galaxies that can zoom by and cause interactions. Also, if you take a, a radio picture of M51, that's up here, on, that's up here on the right, and you see this long neutral hydrogen tail, which shows up only in the radio. And that's a remnant of a previous passage of the companion galaxy around M51. You can actually calculate from the pitch of, the, of, the, of, this, of this tail when that occurred. So M51 has the companion here, and this is what it looks like in optical. And, and upper right is what it looks like in radio. Radio gives you more history. So are tides feasible? Well, actually, there are at least two to three small satellite companion galaxies per spiral. As you go through the universe, every spiral has peppers of little pepper spots of, of dusting of pepper uh, specks of two to three small satellites on average per spiral. There are enough out there to keep things going. Close encounters are common between a small satellite and a big satellite. Between a big satellite and a big satellite, they're not so common. They make fantastic photographs, but when they happen, but they're not so common. All forms of structure, tidal structure can develop. You can get a global structure, a flocculent, a tight structure, a loose structure. You can get all of it by tides. And all you need is the companion galaxy to be one tenth the mass of the spiral, the main galaxy. That's sufficient to produce global structure. You don't need uh, equal mass galaxies. You need a tiny galaxy, one tenth the mass of the spiral or less, uh, depending on how you go by, whether you're far away or close when you encounter. Uh, if you're heavy and you, you, you're, you cause spiral arms earlier in the sequence, if you're lighter, lighter you, caught it, you have to get closer. So do we know what hap what's happening? This is same, the same thing I said before. Starts with tides. Then there's probably a conspiracy of the rest. Collisions, density waves, and gravitational resonances. resonances. Spiral structure is a valuable key to the study of dark matter. I've left dark matter out of this talk because it's a whole new field of its own. But spiral structure is a key to dark matter. Most spirals do not need a, a lot of dark matter to make them stay stable. They just aren't necessary. Simulations, computer simulations are close, but we're not there. Galaxies basically are complicated and we're just not quite where we can 
mimic them very well. And that is what I think is happening with spirals. So I'm going to end with what my favorite ending is. And in the 1850s, Lord Ross do a picture of M51. You see the optical picture of M51 here. But his drawing in black and white is here. He didn't have as nice a telescope as we do now in the 1850s. So I've colored it blue. It's the same drawing. I've just colored it blue. Uh, and it got reprinted in a book. He gave a talk and the, the author of the book was in the audience and he got the picture and put it in the book. An artist was reading the book and he saw the picture of M51 and he decided to draw a picture, paint, paint a painting. His name was Vincent van Gogh. He drew a picture. This should be familiar to most of you. It's called A Starry Night. It's in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. And he put M51 in it. Right there. That's M51. He took the, the, the drawing from the book and put it into the picture. And I think that's just marvelous. I think that's a wonderful pairing of art and science. So thank you very much. I hope you believe that tides are an important part of structure now. So thank you. So Dr. Howard, we do have another question for you, um, sure. asking uh, if any of the models of galactic structure incorporate general relativistic effects. Um, no, not of gala total galaxy structure. If you, if you, if you're driving through the solar system, yes. If you want to hit Mars with your, with your satellite, yes, you got to incorporate general relativity, but on the galaxy scale, we don't usually use general relativity in the equations. Okay, we can have time for a couple more questions. If anyone has any additional questions for Dr. Howard, um, we'll give folks just a, yeah, just, a, just a second uh, to let people type into the chat if they are looking for any qu answers. Um, so is the elliptical galaxies, mm -hmm. um, there, we now believe they're elliptical from formation because I know yeah. for a while they were talking about the evolution of galaxies and and that collisions between galaxies was actually leading to shape changes. That is no longer what is considered. That's no longer considered the answer yet. I mean, it may someday come back, but right now it's not considered the answer. Okay. They're born ellipticals. All right. Well, I am not seeing any additional um, questions in the chat. So I want to thank you for joining us today uh, and thank Dr. Howard for giving us this really heavy talk on galaxies. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I went a little fast and I went into some heavy stuff. Um, somebody is asking about black holes. Well, that was one of your earlier talks uh, yeah. on black holes. That's a whole nother talk. Yeah. Um, so question? Uh, they're just asking about black holes. What about black holes? They ask. That's a little generic. Well, super, supermassive black hole is mm -hmm. in the center of our galaxy. Mm -hmm. And they've just come up with a, an image of the shadow of the gas that surrounds that black hole in, in Sagittarius A star in the center of, our, of, of the Milky Way. That was recently released about, what, a month ago? Yes. Uh, yeah. 
And so that is in the center of our galaxy. Is That's that in the center of our galaxy. That's a supermassive black hole, 40 to 50 billion suns in mass. And is it true that the most, we, we now believe that most galaxies have some sort of supermassive black hole in the center? Spirals, yes. I don't know about ellipticals. I don't know what they believe about ellipticals. Um, whether they have supermassive black holes in their center, probably. Uh, it's just a lot harder to see because you're looking through a, a hard-boiled egg that's harder to look through. With spiral galaxies, if you have it facing you, you can see a lot of structure and you can see the, the black hole. Or the, see the remnants of the black hole. Uh, but with ellipticals, it's a lot harder. Okay. Well, I'm not seeing any additional questions at the moment. So um, I'm going to thank everyone for joining us tonight. I'm going to remind you that you can join the Friends of the Planetarium. Go to our website at friendsoftheplanetarium.org to find out about other events that are coming up. Uh, and to stay informed uh, on the uh, development going on with the planetariums. Oh, looks like we have one more question. Uh, that is, does the structure vary if there are or are not? In, I assume that's about the black holes. This is the person that was asking about black holes. So they're asking, does uh, the structure no. vary? No. Uh, people have speculated that that structure can feed, uh, if the structure gets close to the center, it can feed into the black hole. Uh, quasars, for example, they think may be fed, the supermassive black hole may be fed by nearby gases and structure. And you've actually, you can see an image of our uh, center, Sagittarius A star, and see the stars going around it, and you can see it try to eat a star. Uh, that's as good, close as we can get. But that doesn't affect the global structure. The galaxies are big, so the supermassive black hole is just in the center, in the yolk, and it doesn't affect the rest of the structure. Um, we also have a question. How about that picture of our galaxy at the beginning? I'm not sure if they're referring to one of your first slides. Do you mean the sideways or face on? Oh, oh yes. Remember, you, you had the point in the beginning of the talk. You talked about how do you think we took this picture? Oh, okay. So, so someone's asking, well, how did we take that picture? Okay. It's a sideway, it, it's the side view. And what they do is they put up a satellite uh, and it took them, I think, three years. And that satellite would, I, can you put me up? Uh, you are up. I mean, my, my hands. Uh, yes, we, we, uh, you are, oh. you are there. <clears throat> okay. I'm not, I don't see it. Um, if, if you have, what was I talking about? Answer. You're talking about the, the camera and how we got the picture yeah, the of. The camera starts up at the zenith and scans down this way from top to bottom and gets a bump right in the middle. That's where the galaxy is. And then what it does is go step over to the right and scan up from down to the bottom with a bump in the middle and scan step over. And it took three years of stepping across the galaxy to build up a picture of that sideways galaxy, Milky Way. That's the Milky, that is a picture of the Milky Way. It just took three years to build. And it's looking at, it's, I mean, we're obviously inside that picture. Yes. All right. Um, but it's looking both directions, both towards the center of the galaxy and away from the center of the galaxy. No, it's going from uh, up in the north to the south each time. And it goes across the sky and hits the maximum place where the Milky Way is. And that comes up as a, as a brighter spot. And then it steps sideways and does yeah. the same up 
down with a bounce in the middle where the Milky Way is. So you build up the Milky Way piece by piece. And this was a camera that was in orbit? Or in on... orbit. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We set up a satellite to do exactly this. And I forget the name of the satellite. Somebody might know out there uh, uh, which one it was. But we set up a satellite that actually did this. And it took them several years of work to build up the picture. Because you can't take a picture snapshot to get this. You have to put it together in a computer. Okay. Well, great. Thanks again for for that and for remembering to uh thanks for the comment remembering to ask us about that photograph um and we hope that you will tune in we will be doing another item this summer about the james webb space telescope speaking of orbital cameras yeah. um and we will also hopefully be doing some other events so uh check our website uh which is again friends of the to find out about upcoming events or go to our Facebook page um, or look at our Twitter account. Uh, but until then, we hope that you stay curious and that you keep looking at the sky. I'm going to end the show and stop sharing the screen. All right. Bye-bye, everyone.